Welcome to the Voice of San Diego podcast, where we make sense of local politics, schools, housing, public safety, the civic issues that impact the life of a San Diego resident. We break it down so you can understand it and make educated decisions. Everything that goes into our investigative reporting, the journalists, public records requests, the data crunching, and this very show depends on the support of people like you because we're a nonprofit news organization. Enjoy the show. Welcome to our friends listening on News Radio 600 Kogo. I am Andrew Keats. This is the Voice of San Diego podcast show on the radio, and I'm joined by our friend Lisa Halverstadt. Once Hello, again, Andy. two weeks in a row, Lisa. Yep. Uh, yeah, Scott's out of town, so no Scott. We've got that to look forward to. Um, the other thing we have to celebrate this week is that Tronk is dead. Horrible name. We don't okay. have to hear right. as much anymore. All right. Tronk is not dead, but it is basically out of our lives in any sort of direct way. Uh, Tronk sold the LA Times and the San Diego Union Tribune for $500 million to LA billionaire Patrick Soon Shung. Uh, this is the most recent development in a tumultuous run for the UT. Um, all right. So just to put in perspective how uh, how strange the last few years have been, that paper was owned by the Copley Press, the Copley family, from 1928 through 2009. And then it was bought by a private equity firm. And then that private equity firm in 2011 sold it to hotel magnate and local uh, guy, Doug Manchester. Uh, Then in 2015, the Tribune Publishing Company bought it and shortly thereafter named it to Tronk, which is a terrible name. Um, So, look, the L.A. Times now, because of uh, this new owner, is under local ownership. The UT is now closer to local ownership. It is not technically local ownership. And I think there's still some concern here that the San Diego Union Tribune and San Diego in general will still get lost in the shuffle or play uh, kind of a supporting role um, to the, the the main event here, which is the L.A. Times owned by an L.A. based billionaire. Um, but I think it's probably safe to say that everybody over at the UT's offices are celebrating getting out from under trunk. But for a second, Lisa, journalists talk a lot about this. I don't know if it's something that other people understand our fascination with. Why does local paper ownership matter? What is the what is the the point of that? Why why are we why do we spend so much time talking about it? Well, local ownership of of a paper can dictate a lot of things about how that paper works, the sorts of reporting they'll invest in, their editorial perspective. So I think if if you've lived in San Diego, you know, through all this tumultuous ownership stuff, you'll notice that the editorial page of the UT changed quite a bit when Doug Manchester was in charge versus what we see today. Yes. Uh, remember that front page editorial endorsing Carl DeMaio, for example. Yeah. And it's interesting to, to say also that it isn't just a sheer Republican or Democrat. Because under the Copleys, there's, for, for a very long time, the UT was a, the UT's editorial page, I should say, was a concert, conservative-leaning uh, entity. And so... It became more. It, it was still conservative under Manchester, but the tone and the approach and the willingness uh, that it, it uh, approached these discussions completely changed. Yes, and also, I mean, even just in a recent example, you know, out of town example, we'll pull in um, the newspapers in Pittsburgh and Toledo recently yeah. published a really controversial editorial that the owner had ordered written um, defending Trump's comments about whole countries. And the union in Pittsburgh, the newspaper union, actually tried to write a letter to the editor that wasn't published, you know, disputing that. So yes, but even, I mean, beyond the editorial page ramifications, newspaper ownership can really drive investments and reporting. Mm -hmm. And so a local ownership can mean that the ownership is in the newspaper itself is able to more quickly pivot to important topics to be covered, Mm -hmm. um, maybe new initiatives or to invest in a big investigation that maybe is going to cost a lot, but has a lot of importance for the community, where when it's owned by a big company like Trunk or Gannett, 
things just tend to move more slowly. And a lot of the initiatives are really based more on, you know, national trends that they're seeing versus what works for San Diego. Maybe San Diego readers like to read more about, say, tacos (laughs) than your readers in Cincinnati, where I'm from. Right. And we sh- so we should say that in addition to being a uh, star reporter for us, you are also the local president of the Society of Professional Journalists. So you, you bring that uh, that role to this conversation. Uh, what I th- what I think is interesting about the local ownership thing is when it is discussed as a uh, purely unalloyed good. And. It was on the paper was under local ownership under Doug Manchester and people really didn't like it. It got criticized a lot. Um, at, At the same time, though, I think it would also be fair to say that under Manchester. Well, how how do I want to say this? Under Manchester, it, it was interesting because there's a world in which a lot of the things he did, had they been done by somebody else who didn't carry his baggage, might have been celebrated. I mean, they. Now, th- there's good reason that people were apprehensive about some of his initiatives, but he came in and he did sort of commit more resources to different things. He was trying stuff out. UTTV, UTTV for example. UTTV was a big thing. Like, I, you know, I always thought with, with during UTTV that if this was uh, a just a just a guy who was only known for being wealthy and a philanthropist, Malin Burnham. Maybe people would criticize the wisdom of that decision, but they would have said, "Well, look, he's trying something. The papers are dying, and they're 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 investing in a new and uh, a new approach that maybe will revive things." And instead, with Manchester, it was all negative. And I I I don't necessarily think that th- that it was wrong. I think in in hindsight, we can say clearly that Manchester made bad decisions that reflected poorly on a, on the paper, but. It, it does make me think that people should exercise a bit more caution about their celebration of local ownership. For instance, this guy, Patrick Soon Shung, um, we don't know a great deal about him. I mean, he he's he's a very wealthy doctor. He uh, has been the subject of, of quite a bit of reporting. One of the things he has discussed doing with the paper is creating, using this technology that would sort of be responsive with iPads and phones with a paper there's this uh demonstration video out there where you'd be reading the daily newspaper and if you picked your phone up and held it over a photo in a story it would turn into something like a nightly news video all all, i just don't know who that's for and if if you were to do that the fact that he is based in los angeles wouldn't change that that seems like a dumb idea (laughs) well one thing though i would say i found interesting that you know, there's he's a biotech billionaire, right? Um, and his company has has faced some lawsuits, yeah. in recent history that have made big news. Um, and he has been in the news though, uh, probably more prominently for some comments that he made about cancer yeah. and you know curing finding a cure for cancer within a four year period. Which whoa, yeah, great if we can do that, but wow. Yeah. But those comments that he made actually that got all this attention were made in La Jolla. Oh, really? So it's it's yeah. interesting. He he wrote this letter to staff yesterday that I think, um, you know, did give some people who work for the UT and LA Times more reason for some cautious optimism. He was talking about the importance of journalism, strong local journalism. Mm-hmm. Um, his daughter actually had two internships at the LA Times. Um, so ostensibly, you know, and he, he also, I will say he, um, you know, has before uh, he first kind of entered onto the scene of Tronk Tribune Company back in 2016 when he bought some stakes um, in ownership there. And at the time, he was also talking to a group of um, philanthropists in the L.A. area about potentially buying the L.A. Times and was saying that he basically wanted to, you know, restore the newspaper's integrity. Yeah. So these are some interesting things. To, you know, it'll be very interesting to see, like, how much does he actually focus on San Diego, for yeah. one? Right. Um, I mean, and what does since, he push? Yeah, I mean, since the, UT, or since the UT and the Los Angeles Times became part of the same entity, the UT has 
has been a place to cut and to find redundancies and combine them. And uh, you know, typically that, that hasn't mostly been in the newsroom. It has to some extent. It's mostly been on the operations side. And now the paper's printed uh, up in, what is, when is it, Orange, like Riverside, Orange County, something like that, and, and trucked down here where it's, it used to be printed here. And mm-hmm. that has caused some disruption in how early people get their papers. Um, I hope that that, that sort of uh, uh, finding duplicative roles and combining them doesn't continue on the newsroom side. Um, so I, I don't know. It's, it's something to look for. We've got this new, uh, new billionaire in our lives, Patrick Shun Young, who is now the owner of our paper. So we'll keep a close eye on it. I, I will just say that I think the UT has a incredibly strong newsroom right now. I think there's a lot of good young reporters who've been there for a, a few years who are doing really good work and probably have their best work ahead of them. I think they've got a good, strong veteran staff. So, uh, you know, uh, with with support from ownership and getting out from under what was um, pretty clearly a, a huckster mess in Tronk, I think is, is only good news. Um, but I think it might be a little bit premature to celebrate too much. I agree. And and one thing I would say is, you know, this comes up a lot, but I think it bears repeating. Um, you know, you might think, oh, Voice of San Diego, we, you know, we would love maybe for the UT to cut back and for us to really benefit from that. But really, we all benefit from their coverage and their ability to cover important stories in our community. Um, more journalism is better. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's any question anybody in here what what we want from Sim. We want the UT to be as big and successful and to be as uh, as as full every day as possible. So uh, here's to hoping for the best. Um, okay, so here's another thing I wanted to talk about, Lisa. Pot is just absolutely disrupting local government. And Scott and I have talked about this, but I, I don't think it's clear that many people, and I certainly include myself in that, had fully grokked the extent to which California's decision to legalize pot was just going to become a major ongoing pressure test on the competency of local government. Um, So Jesse Marks for us has covered extensively some of the issues on the horizon for the legal industry. Um, Essentially, locally, that really only exists in the city of San Diego right now. Um, The industry is expecting to run into shortages in the near future um, as cities in the state struggle to build uh, a regulatory regime regime for supply uh, for the supply chain side of things that's got to be set up by this summer Um, that's when they sort of need to start selling product that comes out of this new regulated supply chain meanwhile a bunch of other cities are in the phases right now of setting up their own regulatory systems and the da and sheriff's races have become flashpoints for this issue and more specifically the tension between the federal government and the state of California, uh, Jesse this week wrote about how Genevieve Jones Wright, who's running for district attorney, told Jesse that she will simply refuse to cooperate with the federal government in any way. Um, she invoked the resistance that this would be part of of her role as a member of the resistance. And when he asked her what that looks like, she said it looks like this, and held up her middle finger. Um, and uh, this is all happening at the same time, you know, so that the county of San Diego had early on basically installed a prohibition on recreational marijuana establishments in the unincorporated part of the county. And it's just a mess. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, um, but basically the, the, they're opening dis- illegal dispensaries faster than the county is capable of shutting them down. One anecdote that our our friend and producer who's sitting next to me, Kinsey Moreland, pulled out is that you know, there was a, a place that was shut down in the morning and it was up again and selling product by that afternoon. That sort of prohibition may have felt good to take that vote at the time almost a year ago, but it seems pretty clearly unwieldy and counterproductive at this point. And so I'm curious what you think, you know, to, to invoke a, a separate topic, Councilman Chris Kate. Uh, last year after the city council failed to pass Airbnb regulations said we are incapable of governing said that this 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 is evidence that this city council cannot govern 
the newfound legalization of marijuana in California, I think, is putting the test to a mom- number of different local governments about how capable they are of governing. What do you think? Well, first off, we should say that in this case, actually, the city of San Diego, mm-hmm. they act- they got our hero yeah. recently because they actually did make a plan. They approved regulations. They even had a tax on the ballot. So yeah. they're pretty good. Haven't really heard a and lot sure of And I'm sure there will be some problems with their San system. Diego. Right? I'm sure yeah. that as it goes along, we'll figure out that they made some mistakes. This was too tight. This was too loose. But at least once you start the process, you can start iterating it, right? I mean, you've you've got to get something on the books. But these other cities and the county, all over the place. Yeah. I have to commend our colleague, Jesse Marks, too. He did this great story, highly recommend checking it out, um, back in December, just laying out where all of these different communities are, plus what the vote was, what percentage of folks in that community approved marijuana legalization. It was a pretty interesting post, but... Again, like what it really showed to me was that they're all over the place in these processes. And, you know, again, got to shout out a colleague, Kinsey Moreland's great story about how these dispensary raids are happening. Just completely exposed how (laughs) crazy the situation is right now. Well, I think you've got a situation where it's like you've got people who have spent their entire adult lives, decades, with a a pretty clear, clearly established political belief that marijuana is a drug. It's a bad idea to legalize it. I I don't support uh, decriminalization. I don't support uh, and any of these steps along the way towards this thing. And now the voters preempt them. They legalize it, and people like didn't just dissolve those beliefs overnight. So they're taking these votes to do things like the county board of supervisors did to to enact this prohibition. And I don't know how much they stopped to think. What are we achieving? What 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 do we get out of this? Is even if I believe that this drug is bad and dangerous and will cause crime, is this system the best way to handle it? Mm-hmm. And and does doing this actually expend more resources yeah. that could be directed in another fashion and be more effective? So one of the points that Commander uh, Dave Myers, who's running for sheriff, is making that is that. The way that the county is handling this now actually creates more safety issues. And he's argued they should kind of rework that and maybe focus more on opioids since that's more of a crisis that, you know, has other ramifications. Um, So it'll be interesting to see. I'm also really closely uh, watching as much as I have time uh, on uh, what D.A. Summer Steffen is going to do on this issue. Yeah, and you know, we should say that that she's interim DA right now um and it, to she it's been muted to some extent but she has changed the the policy direction of that office from her predecessor Bonnie Demonis. Um notably she dropped charges against James Sladek, this marijuana entrepreneur who was facing um pretty heavy pressure from Bonnie Demonis. Um so so that in itself is a is an expression of the fact that things are changing. I, I think we'll I I just think that in ten years we'll look back on some of these decisions to prohibit marijuana or to make uh dispensary making it uh overly onerous to set up a dispensary. We'll just look back and it'll be seen as this like death knell of the uh, of the old discussions we used to have about the drug. And now our Hero of the Week. This week's hero is VOSD contributor Kelly Davis and attorneys at Shepard Mullen, who represented her pro bono after she was hit with a terrifying demand for any journalist. Kelly wrote a series of damning stories about San Diego County jail deaths a few years ago for City Beat. After a judge refused to throw out a suit over a death that a case involving a death that did cite her reporting, the county responded by actually pulling Davis into the case. They subpoenaed her and demanded her notes, sources, and other information. Law firm Shepard Mullen stepped in to represent her, and last Friday, a judge ruled Davis won't have to give any information. Davis was rattled by all this, but has said she'll continue to report on jail deaths. Shepard Mullen also represents VOSD in legal cases. We're cheering for both Davis and Shepard Mullen this week. And now our GOAT of the week. 
You lose. Good day, sir. All right. So the city's water department has been inundated with complaints from residents who are facing exorbitant water bills. And unfortunately, the city has just not done a good job explaining what it knows and what it does not know. Uh, instead, it's basically been making assertions without supportive data, as our buddy Rye, report, Rye Rivard reported this week. Uh, I mean, basically, the city's response has been that new smart meters are working just fine and are not related to this issue, even though the city has not done any before and after analysis that would allow them to make that statement. And many residents do think that it's their new water meters that are spiking their bills. Uh, at the same time, a city committee that is entirely devoted to water rate oversight um, could barely hold its last meeting because so few people showed up. Um, its next meeting, while all this is happening, has been canceled. So, uh, look, I, I'm i sure that there's some false positives going on and that there's some issues around this water bill reporting that are not anyone's fault and might have nothing to do with water rates and maybe really do have to do with leaks. But the city has kind of incomprehensibly to me just decided to take this stance that everything's fine and that people are mistaken. And I don't know that it's the right way to do it. And I'm sure it's pissing people off. Not a good look. Yeah. All right. That's it. That's all we've got for this week. I think that Scott might be back next week. It's hard to say. He's always gallivanting to other, some other part of the country, uh, speaking on some panel about uh, reader engage, engagement or whatever it is that he does. Um, but thank you for coming on the show. We've got after this an interview with uh, hopeful for the county supervisors, Lori Saldana. Stick around. The Voice of San Diego podcast is sponsored in part by Manolatos Nelson Murphy, Advertising and Public Relations. As a nonprofit news organization, Voice of San Diego depends on our members, foundations, and sponsors like m and We are very grateful for all of our supporters and are happy to recognize them during our shows. m and is run by Tony Manolatos, Bob Nelson, and Kelly Murphy Lampkin who bring a vast network and decades of advertising and public relations experience to businesses, nonprofits, government agencies, and campaigns. M&M bridges the gap between clients and the people whose influence matters most. M&M is a full service agency that helps clients develop their strategy and launch cost-effective tactics. The firm specializes in public affairs PR and advertising with an emphasis on media relations, crisis communications, community outreach, coalition building, and broadcast, print, direct mail, and digital advertising. Learn more about m and at mnmadpr.com. And if you like our work and are interested in becoming a sponsor, contact us at podcasts at voiceofsandiego.org. And we are back in the great Voice of San Diego podcast studio in downtown San Diego. And we are now joined by former Assemblywoman and current candidate for the County Board of Supervisors, Lori Saldana. Lori, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Um, okay, so I think last time we had you in the studio was, geez, it seems weird to say, but about two years ago now. The mayoral campaign. You were running for mayor. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you were uh, running... As an independent, you are now uh, fully registered as a member of the Democratic Party again for this race. I returned, right, about right, a year where, ago. Where you returned mm -hmm. to. Can you uh, walk us through a little bit of that decision? What What was it that changed? What was it uh, that coaxed you back into the party? Well, like many people, the uh, election, the way the presidential election went, and uh, seeing a lot of the fighting uh, within the party and thinking, okay, it's all hands on deck. We really need to get this back on track and figure out why uh, you can win the popular vote in the mm -hmm. country and you can't coalesce around a candidate in a way that uh, delivers the, the electoral votes. Um, and I think here in San Diego in particular, we had similar infighting, and we continue, as I've, I've found since I've returned, it's <laughs> continued to have similar infighting, where we have what people 
characterized as moderate, business-friendly Democrats, uh, which sometimes contradicts with the more progressive uh, and, you know, frankly, younger, more people of color, more working-class Democrats. Uh, so those divisions are still not fully healed. Yeah. Is that, and so that was what led you to leave the party? Well, what led me to lead the party was the whole deception around Bob Filner. Really? And the fact that I had gone to the county party chairman at the time and before the 2012 election and said, look, I have the confidence of several women who do not want to be publicly disclosed. They are concerned about harassment, that Bob Filner has been harassing them. And if I'm getting half a dozen women coming to me, chances are that there are a lot more. And the chairman's response was, they have to come to me. And so now with the Me Too movement, I see. I think we can see more clearly how frustrating and aggravating that was. That that I had worked to earn their trust and confidence, and he and I was chair of the Women's Caucus. I had served six years in the legislature, and he didn't believe me. Yeah. Um, so that's really why I left. So, and we. Uh, I was thinking we'd get to this later, but we brought it up, so let's just dive in right now. So the your. Um, your presence during the Filner situation was was an interesting and, and kind of complicated one, I think. Mm-hmm. So um, some of Bob Filner's supporters came out and said that he was doing things. At first, they didn't specify them. They said he needed to resign. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, I think it actually Liam Dillon reported that you had told him, look, this was not a, not a secret. I was told about these things a long time ago. And I brought them to the county party and they didn't listen to me. But also around that same time, you were pretty outspoken in saying. Um, Women Bob, needed to come forward. And yeah. Right, so initially. And, and eventually they did. Yeah. And because I didn't want the same thing that happened when I spoke up and women refused to come forward out of professional fear that they would lose their contacts with his office. They would lose a professional relationship with his staff. So I made it very clear. These women have to come forward. Yeah. And and. Just like the Me Too movement, until and unless women are willing to speak up and say, this happened to me, then they won't be taken, you know, they won't, the the legal system and the court of public opinion tends to disregard the allegations. Well, and and also during the proceedings as the, as the situation heated up, you also were pretty outspoken about saying uh, he nonetheless deserves due process and he should not be forced out, forced to resign. It became highly politicized. And, and we're seeing that again this year. And my concern was, if you force someone out without a process, then you have no process going forward to force other people out because it's just done on their own volition. And we're seeing that exactly in Sacramento. Uh, there has now been a hurry-up measure put forward in the Senate to how do we extend a suspension of a member because Tony Mendoza, a man I served with, has not been playing ball up there. He's supposed to be on voluntary suspension, and he's still carrying out his duties. So if you don't have a very strict procedure... And you know, I'm a community college teacher, and I've been in the district here in San Diego for decades. We have very clear policies on how you handle these types of complaints and disputes. And the reason is to protect everyone involved. So there's no question. There's no, well, he left, so it's okay. It's like, no, it's not okay. If, If he leaves voluntarily and we never get to the root of how this happened, then it's going to continue to happen. So that was why I said we need a process. It was as much to protect future women from having a similar abusive relationship where they could say, well, last time that guy left on his own terms, it's happening again. Do I have to wait till he leaves on his own terms? It's like, no, we need procedures that protect people proactively. Okay. So, so then during the, uh, the latter stages of the Fildner saga, Mm -hmm. your concern was around uh, really the, the process of it. You, it wasn't that you were standing by, by him. Absolutely not. And that's where it does, unless I have time to sit down, and I'm grateful for the chance here in the podcast to say, explain why I wanted procedure, mm-hmm. it's because it protects people proactively mm-hmm. going forward. The next time someone, and we know there always is a next time. Uh, I mean, we see it yeah. now. Now we can say, well, look, here's the, here's the things that have to happen, They're either to prevent it or to conclusively deal with that person right away and get them out of the mix. I don't know if this has been a, a conscious thing that um, that has happened in Sacramento, D.C., in boardrooms in Hollywood and Wall Street. I, I don't know if this has been conscious, but it seems to me for, as an outsider that, um, and maybe this is your issue, is that people actually prefer if 
it's just public pressure that forces a, a resignation because it's it's cleaner. There's no lawsuits or there might not be a lawsuit or the lawsuit comes later and it's, you know. So let's let's look at that from the Donald Trump perspective. OK. Yeah. Look what he is accused of now and mm-hmm. look how the community, the public sentiment is. If you had allowed previous presidents to be paying off people, um, you know, to make payments to people because of affairs, to acknowledge grabbing women inappropriately, if you had had any previous president acknowledge any of those offenses, the public sentiment would have been markedly different than it is for this president. Why is that? Because we don't have any firm procedures. It's just public sentiment. And that's the danger to all of us. Because if someone can get away with with abusing one population, one part of the population, and people, even evangelicals say, well, you know, hate the sin, love the sinner. (laughs) Um, So that's why I say, if we don't have agreed upon procedures and a process that we we use whatever institutions are there, whether it's legal, ju- you know, judicial, legislative, um, then it's up to whatever the majority thinks is okay at the time. So we, I promise we'll get to your campaign-related well, issues. Well, this is a lot yeah. about the campaign, okay. though. Okay, good. Okay, well, if, that, if that, that's good. Then, well, th- well so let's, uh, let's lead this into a, a related discussion that's going on right now, which is mm-hmm. uh, some of the turmoil in the local uh, labor movement and Absolutely. the local party. Absolutely. Um, so you told me and um, that Mickey Kasparian is the leader for UFCW. And we have these two factions. Yeah, and it's the UFCW members who should decide whether he is their leader or somebody else is they their leader. They elected him. They and, have a process to get rid of an elected official within their organization. Okay, and so so your, to your view, way of viewing things, Mickey Kasparian, whatever is alleged to him in these laws, about him in these leg- lawsuits, it is UFCW members who make the decision about whether he retains that role. Well, and again, to understand what's going on, we, we have to take a step back. And how did this uh, family council evolve? Well, there was something going on within or the labor the, the, council. Sorry, the family council is Mickey Kasparian's splinter group. Right. Okay. Well, I, it's not a splinter group. I mean, it's, it, they it's took, a new group. They took 60% of the revenues from the labor council when mm-hmm. they left because of the size of the unions that they represent who went with them. So that was not, that's not a splinter group. A yeah. splinter group is the labor council that's struggling to hold on with, with less revenue by you know, 60% less mm-hmm. revenue. So you have a real battle going on between these two organizations. And one of the things that astonished me, just as when the allegations against uh, Carl DeMaio came out in mm-hmm. 2014, mm-hmm. Um, I was one of the only people saying, look, this does not meet the smell test. These allegations to me are so outrageous and used in such a politically motivated way that we have to be really careful of how we establish their veracity. And sure enough, after the election was over, Todd Bosnich was found guilty in federal court of obstruction of justice, that he had lied, he had misled investigators, but it was too late. The election was over. So in the same way, when these allegations about Mickey Kasparian started coming out, I met with the women, I heard their allegations, I signed the letter of support, and then they went to court. And I said, okay, from my perspective, they have a process, it's moving forward. Then I started hearing, well, this really was generated from labor council, that these allegations were the result of their being upset about neutralizing a person who walked away with a lot of their money, or they thought it was their money. Um, and I, I really well, have the allegations to came out before anybody walked away. I don't think so. Yeah, no, the Working Families Council was established in February of last year. The first allegation against Gasparian was, was in December, was year? four months earlier in December, December 2016. Is that the th- no, there was there was already there were already fissures between the the building trades and the labor council at that point, but it, it, there hadn't been it, it hadn't resulted so, okay. in a working families council. All right, I'm I'm getting it. Uh, it's, I, it's okay. I, it's I had okay. a busy 2016, so yeah, pardon me yeah. for think for convoluting some of these um, these timelines. So are you, are you now skeptical of the accusations against Kasparian? I never said I was skeptical of the allegations. I was saying the way they are being handled, and I wrote about this in the Union Tribune, let's not politicize these allegations mm-hmm. because then the survivors get pushed to the background. Then you, don't, you lose track of the people, the human beings, whose lives are changed forever by these incidents, and instead it becomes a political witch hunt. And you start going after people to weaken them politically as opposed to getting justice and restorative justice for the people who have survived the abuse. And so this uh, situation culminated recently in uh, the 
uh, Labor Council had their early endorsement meeting or their strategic endorsement meeting a month What ago. troubles me about those strategic, those came through, well, first, I and others had contacted Keith Maddox, who's the trustee taking over operations at the Labor Council, right. and said, we are interested in your process. Well, we're working it out. And I was given a timeline beginning in March of when they would start accepting uh, endorsement applications. Suddenly, I get emails from friends saying, hey, we're sitting down today, January 19th, based on recommendations from labor, uh, different labor unions who had strategic candidates. So I checked with, with other labor folks and said, what's going on? This timeline got bumped up by weeks. I never heard a thing about it. And I heard, well, we used to do strategic endorsements or strategic races, mm -hmm. but not endorsements. So the, the Labor Council under you know, the building trades leadership primarily started following the same process as what the San Diego County Democratic Party did, where they used to identify strategic races, but not strategic candidates. And then they would let the candidates work out their bona fides as they you know, mm -hmm. campaigned. Mm -hmm. So the other thing I noticed is not one African-American candidate from the entire county of San Diego, actually it might be two counties, San Diego Imperial counties, was nominated for an early strategic endorsement interview. Okay. Well, so... One of, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, and I think it, it dovetails nicely here, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, um, were you to win, you would be the lone, at least for two years, you would be the lone Democrat on the County Board of Supervisors for Republicans, which was the same situation that Dave Roberts was in uh, for his four years on the board. And um, it naturally puts you in a severe minority position. Some of the things that people are are, are uh, campaigning on are going to be very difficult to do when you are represent just one vote. Um, meanwhile, like you, you've also, you know, as you've outlined here, you're in this situation where you're, you've got uh, feuds, I th for lack of a better word, going with uh, the Imperial County Labor, uh, the San Diego Imperial County's Labor Union, Building Trades, um, formerly with the party, what I mean, what can you do as one vote on a board of supervisors um, when not only are you the only Democrat, but a Democrat that has sort of for a few years now had a number of well-publicized internecine feuds mm -hmm. with your ostensible allies? My base of support is never within the party. And I, I tell people I am a progressive first and foremost and a Democrat secondarily. And if you look at the results of the last few elections, just to give you an example, when people say, well, where, where's your support? How are you going to get anything done? Uh, I got more votes in the elected or the endorsed Democrat in last year's mayoral election or 2016 mayoral election. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking back at the record. I received more votes as an independent running for mayor than the two previously endorsed Democrats running for mayor, including Bob Filner, who was the only Democrat on the ticket in 2012. There were a lot of other people running. He was the only Democrat. And I still received more votes than he did. So clearly, I have a base of support in this city that cuts across party lines. It's, it's very broad. And I think it's people who more than ever want a progressive voice speaking on their behalf. My power will come from their participation in what I bring forward. And what I intend to bring forward is not just uh, policies that will be voted down by colleagues, Although I think I will present some pretty good economic arguments. For example, why are we investing $1.9 billion in San Diego, and yet we have now have hundreds of people dead from the flu, many more than other comparable counties in Southern California? What are we doing differently that is resulting in worse outcomes, despite almost $2 billion invested in health and human services? Let's look at it from a, just a clear economic and outcome-based yeah, perspective. Just a good, good government perspective. What, right. are we, what are we getting for this money we're spending? And, and so when I show up, I will be doing resolutions. There's a good resolution that's being brought forward next week on the agenda to no to offshore drilling that Gaspar is bringing forward. I would happily sign on to something like that. I think I can work with Diane Jacob on clean energy. She's no fan of what uh, San Diego Gas and Electric has been doing to the East County residents. I could work with her, I believe, on, on clean, safe energy generation. Uh, Greg Cox and I have worked in the past on cross-border issues. And so I, I think I can find some common ground, not 100% of the time, but certainly on some issues that are important and, uh, and base it on some real factual evidence. We need to do better. We need to be preventing these deaths, these epidemics of hepatitis. Um, we need to be housing people. I think that we can find some common agreement, and the support will be there from the people that are not just in this district, because when I ran for mayor, it went you know, far beyond the boundaries of District 4.
Well, let's get into some of the big issues, sure. too, in the county race here coming up. We've had just a chorus of progressives saying that the county should free up some of its reserves and spend more of the millionaire's tax money that's flowing in. So right now, just to kind of set the stage for everybody, uh, the county has a reserve of almost $2 billion, which has a lot of strings attached to it. Right. Um, and it also has uh, more than $150 million in this millionaire's tax fund. That's the Prop to be 63. Prop 63 money um, that's to be spent on mental health services. So Correct. many of your other there's uh, Dems that are running for office here are calling for more of that money to be freed up. But what would you do? What you, what well, would you what suggest? my record already shows that I've done. When I chaired housing and community development in the assembly, I allocated more funds to supportive housing, to affordable housing, to transit-oriented development. Let's give people more access to what we then had were redevelopment funds and tax increment funds, which have gone away. Um, but when we had those monies, then we would be putting them into the kind of housing that is sadly lacking in San Diego. And let me just, you mentioned the other Democrats, the other progressives running. No one else in this race has a progressive record they can stand on. We have six candidates. Three have no elected office, uh, have never held elected office. And the other two have only held elected office as Republicans. So they are actually running away from their record on many of these issues. I'm the only one who's solidly running on my record, and I'm very proud of my progressive record on housing affordability, on supportive housing, on climate change, on marriage equality, on, you know, there's a long, long list on environmental protection. And so uh, when people say, what are you going to do? I say, well, look at what I've done. I've increased funding for these programs, for veterans, for military families, uh, for food assistance. We tried to get more help for people in the past. Because if you look at what homelessness is, 20% of our homeless population are African American. They're only five or 6% of the county population. How do you explain that? Well, mass incarceration. If you come out of prison with a drug conviction, you are not eligible for a lot of the housing assistance programs because of federal policies. So we need to do our own funding of homelessness or of, of affordable and supportive housing and cut the ties to those federal policies that make it more difficult for people with drug convictions. We also need to expunge a lot of those drug convictions for marijuana under Prop 64. We can do that. But we need to understand why is this 20 percent of African-Americans are homeless compared to five or six percent of the population? It's mass incar incarceration. It's the war on drugs. And it is disproportionately hurting those communities of color. If you understand that, then you can start taking steps at the local level to address a big part of the homeless population in San Diego. Well, and many uh, others in, in town on both sides of the aisle have suggested that the county should take more of a leading role in trying to address homelessness. What would you suggest that that role should be? You did mention housing and... and uh, well, it would the, the city, I, I've been down there testifying at the Homelessness Select Committee, and we have said all along, uh, you know, many of us who are advocates, the city needs to start looking at the health and welfare of people in a more organized, systemic fashion. Right now, they defer to the county. But the fact is, it is downtown San Diego. And a simple case would be those fault line park bathrooms. I mean, I advocated for a year and a half and said, this public-private partnership is not working. If you're going to invest public funds and pu in pu public money in restrooms, then keep them open for people to use. And instead, we had the Halcyon restaurant owner who since departed, refusing to open up those restrooms. That was clearly a city's responsibility for basic sanitation. And if we don't, again, look at simple numbers, where are the most people with the, the most risk to their health and safety? The same, let's take a look at sexual assault. Uh, when I ran for mayor, I brought forward the fact we have a backlog of thousands of sexual assault evidence kits. Most people at that time two years ago had never heard of that. Now it's being debated in City Hall, and it's being debated in the county uh, district attorney's race. Um, when you educate people on issues, they respond, and I always say, when the people lead, the leaders follow. So now we have discussions taking place at City Council. Why are so many of these sexual assaults downtown? It's where unsheltered people are. So the city does have a responsibility to deal with homelessness from a public safety and a health standpoint. And I'm, maybe we should talk about the $900 million bond that's being proposed because that's a city initiative. And yes, but you are running for county supervisor, not for city council okay. or mayor. Fair so what, what kind of solutions would you push if elected to county supervisor? So the, the Prop 63 funds, the supportive housing funds, 
uh, any new development that the county is looking at now, they are looking at housing older adults and veterans, uh, but also supportive housing for people that have, whether it's mental illness, drug, alcohol, which are often coexisting disorders because people self-medicate. Uh, so I would really be looking at, again, what are, what are the core roots of people who are becoming homeless? And can we step in and interrupt that cycle, that downward cycle? A lot of it is health care costs. A lot of these are people who are relying on public assistance for health care, uh, or a lot of them are caregivers living at very low wages, and the person that they are providing caregiving for may be a family member who dies, and suddenly that person's income that paid for their housing disappears as they, they die. So when I was out providing water and cooling stations for homeless people and tracking how many explanations for how people became homeless, it was often death of a person in the family who provided income to keep them housed. Uh, it was disability and illness that prevented them from working, and they didn't have benefits you know, at their job that would keep them going uh, till they recuperated. And that's the other thing I've mentioned in, in testimony, and I'll continue to talk about, is we need a restorative care village to, for people to recuperate. You don't release someone with hepatitis onto the streets and expect them to recover. They die. And that's why we've had at least 20 deaths that we know of, along with the nearly 600 cases of hepatitis, because so many of them were people who lacked adequate shelter, they lacked adequate nutrition. So we deal with you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You deal with shelter. You deal with food. You deal with health care. You have a solid base for those people to start moving up and finding employment, staying in stable housing. Um, the county needs to do more in those areas. We're also seeing, again, a very deadly flu uh, epidemic that's going on in San Diego right now. And I think that, that plus the hepatitis is a good indicator. Those are two good indicators that despite nearly $2 billion in healthcare spending, they're missing the mark somewhere on protecting people's health and well-being. Well, and you were, as you noted um, early on, you were sounding the, the alarm about hepatitis A. Uh, we're raising issues about public restroom availability. Uh, we certainly wrote about those issues. Um, what are And the loss of affordable housing in Penasquitos. When I was a candidate, I wrote about going to a hearing up there. So it was coming up on two years since that hearing when there were hundreds of older, English learning, disabled retirees who were living at Penasquitos Village. And they were being told this is going to be converted over to market rate housing. And, uh, you know, I was up there with other people, Ed Harris, who was also running for mayor. And we looked at each other afterwards and said, we are looking at the faces of the next generation of homeless people in San Diego. When you have a policy and the county needs to step in on this, too. We, we have all these silos, the Housing Commission, the Housing Federation. We have all these silos dealing with homelessness. No one's ever said, and well, Rick Gentry has acknowledged, we don't know how many affordable housing units we have lost over the years. So then the question was, who's responsible for tracking this? If not the Housing Federation or if not the Housing Commission, who is? Because if you, the, and short-term vacation rentals fit into that as well. I know that's, again, a city issue. But I tell people, you have a cup of housing. And I know you can't see this on the radio but, or on the podcast, but I'm holding a cup of water. If you punch a bunch of holes in the bottom and allow those affordable housing units that are in this cup to start leaking out, no matter how much you pour in the top of new affordable or supportive housing, you're never going to fill the cup. And that's what's happening as they redevelop these current affordable housing units. And it's also what happens when you take affordable apartments at the beach out of residential market and turn them into short-term vacation rentals. So... I appeared and testified at the marathon hearing the city council held and, and basically told them that. You need to factor in this to the regional housing needs assessment for all of San Diego. Otherwise, you are never going to provide enough housing for the people who are never going to be going back to work because they're old and disabled and retired or they have permanent chronic disabilities. And instead of keeping those housing stocks available, you're converting them over to other types of uses. Are there specific strategies that you would advocate at the county level as far as housing, health care, other things that you've referred to here? Well, I mentioned all these unknowns because people are not doing the assessments. Why are people dying at a higher rate than other counties nearby? And when I made that comment in public testimony, I got a follow-up call from the communications uh, department at the county afterwards trying to dispute and push me away from those numbers. I still haven't seen any evidence that we're off track. So it makes me think, who's doing your investigations? 
who is looking at your outcomes and analyzing them against what you're putting into this. And this, whether it's with the number of deaths from these infectious diseases or the number of homeless people as a result of these changes to other policies and loss of affordable housing stock, I would direct my staff to start digging into, you know, if no one else in the county is, I would start saying, let's investigate, let's do some research, let's identify what's contributing to these things because apparently they, they don't have some firm numbers on it. One of the other issues that uh, we have identified in the county recently is um, this: the the, the county's uh, essential ban on uh, recreational marijuana dispensaries. Very short sighted. In the uh, the uh, what's the term? The well, also cultivation in the county. Yeah, I mean, and so in, in any of the areas that where they govern land use, they have right. determined that there can be no uh, recreational marijuana facilities, and so we were able to document in this area around Spring Valley, which is under the county's control. I mean. Shops are just opening up in droves far faster than the county's capable of shutting them down. Right. Sometimes it's, you know, we had one anecdote where someone was shut down in the morning and was open in the same location selling again by the afternoon. So just just a matter <laughs> of hours later. It's the cost of doing business as far as they're concerned. Well, you know, I mean, so I imagine it's pretty so, easy to imagine that you don't approve of that policy. But what should the county have done on this matter? Well, again, you know, it's. If you don't ask the right questions, if you don't ask, for example, how much law enforcement money will we lose if we just prohibit these retail operations or cultivation in unincorporated areas, and then how much statewide money in law enforcement do we stand to lose with this, I think if they had crunched some numbers and recognized, so we're going to be doing more enforcement, but we have fewer dollars to fund that enforcement, then they may have not done that quick knee-jerk reaction of a policy that they did first thing uh, last year after new members were sworn in. So, um, you know, I, I've been a teacher for four decades, and I can tell how people are learning by the questions that they ask, not the answers they produce, but you have to start with a question to produce an answer. So when I teach information technology, or if I were leading uh, a policy change like that, a significant policy shift, I would want to make sure all the good questions had been asked, like how much is it going to cost to enforce this, and where's that money going to come from? Because Prop 64 figured that out. And they said, if you have a policy allowing this retail operation, then you will get a share of the projected revenues, and that will help fund your management of, of these issues. Apparently, no one recognized that and, and cal calculated that into the cost of this policy. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's another uh, side of it that's just like, well, what are you trying to accomplish here? Because all of the cities around you, or some many of the cities around you, are going to be permitting these dispensaries, you are a governing body over a large area that includes many places where marijuana will be bought and sold Remember, legally. This, this so what, is, like, what, have you, what have you gained? This <laughs> is know? a county where the leadership and the board has not changed for a quarter century. Yeah. They resisted for years recognizing the 1996 ballot measure for medicinal compassionate use marijuana. They went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. This county had went all the way to the state Supreme Court to avoid having to enforce a reasonable legal climate action plan. You have a makeup. You have leadership that has been there a quarter century, and their mindset is not looking forward. And I always say, when people ask, what is a progressive? A progressive is someone who votes on things that may not get through that year or even the next year, but maybe in 5, 10, 20 years, people will recognize that's what direction we needed to go in. So... If we have a more progressive vision on the board, which we desperately need right now, then some of these issues can be addressed. And hopefully we will be bringing more people, more progressives in going forward in 2020 when Greg Cox is gone. And um, as our political climate shifts and more people are engaged to vote. Uh, but again, looking at my record in, in Sacramento, I introduced 10 years ago a law prohibiting the cooperation of state law enforcement with federal DEA because of asset seizures, forfeitures, um, and now it's been reintroduced because they're recognizing, wow, we're losing a lot of money to the feds when they seize the assets of our state citizens and residents, and we get nothing in return. And now, so, yeah, and there is a, there is a, a movement with feds to kind of coax cooperation by right. dangling some of those those seized assets. So ten years ago, I introduced a bill. I got it through the public safety committee, through appropriations, and then it stalled on the floor. Now I think it's had a good chance of getting through because they're recognizing this is going to damage our our industry, and this is a, a real industry that's going to produce real revenues for the state. 
Uh, so I look back at some of the bills I introduced. They didn't make it through the first time, and I'm sure I'll be frustrated the same way at the county, that there'll be things I introduce, and they get shelved, and they get blocked. But the, we need to move forward, and that doesn't mean you, you give up and you stop doing it. One of the bills I introduced was uh, ending open carry of handguns in California. And I tell people the two senators who delayed the vote and the passage of the bill to give it time to get to the floor and get to the governor's desk, they're both in prison now. <laughs> so who were they? Leland Yee, he, he financed his campaign for mayor, of, I think he ran for mayor of San Francisco with gun running operations. He's in prison. And his seatmate, the two of them kept delaying the vote on the final uh, amendment on my bill in the Senate. Um, Ron Calderon, who's in prison for bribery and, uh, you know, corruption. So I tell people if, if, if my good progressive bills are blocked, and it did become law the next year, um, so, so open carry in California is now against the law. So I say, you know, if it takes convicted felons to block my <laughs> bills from getting through, it's just I'm not going to stop introducing those kinds of bills. I'm just going to have to make sure we don't elect uh, people who are likely to become convicted felons in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can. There's bipartisan agreement uh, on the, on that front. Uh, Lori Saldana, thank you for coming in. Uh, good luck in your campaign for the County Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Thanks very much. The Voice of San Diego podcast is part of the Voice of San Diego podcast network. Visit voiceofsandiego.org slash podcast to learn more about the Cura Chaos show about movers and shakers on both sides of the border, Beer Talk Radio, our business shows Startup Vault and I Made It in San Diego, and the rest of the shows in the network. If you like the show, go to voiceofsandiego.org and click the donate button. Or if you'd like to sponsor it, contact me at kinsey at vosd.org. That's K-I-N-S-E-E at V-O-S-D dot O-R-G.